Hi, Vicky. Hi, Shane. If you, so we're going back to questions as, or just like quizzing I you. Just love it. No, questions this week. We quizzed last week. Um, yeah. it, if you could be a TV personality, what would you be or who would you be? Oh, um, I, have, I, I feel no like better I want to have a daytime talk show. Ooh. I want to be Drew Barrymore. Oh my God. So that's like, that's like exactly who I thought of first. Yeah. <gasps> really? What would your, um, what would your talk show be called? And what would it like, what would differentiate it from other talk shows? Oh my gosh. Why are you asking me these questions? Like I'm supposed to. Because I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I was going to say I'm a journalist. Call? I am not a journalist, um, but I'm kind of a journalist. Like it's my job to ask questions and to interview people and to interrogate. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I guess <laughs> it would be called something. Oh man, that's so hard. I want to have like a really good, thoughtful, smart name. Cause now I feel like if I say it out loud, then this is going to be my show. I can't. Okay, well, maybe we'll come back to it at the, at the end about, of the episode. Okay, you okay, think, think You think while we record little. the rest okay. of this today. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, I could do it. <laughs> I don't, um, I, again, in the um, tried and true tradition of creating these prompts and then not actually thinking about them for myself. <laughs> <laughs> on it, but I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'd want to be on TV or even on video. I, I don't get as... Um, squeamish i guess as some people do about seeing themselves on mm -mm. like on film well, no. like lowercase film but yeah i i prefer i actually like what i'm doing i like being a, a podcast person out that's weird to say uh but i do kind of like it i'd be on radio i don't know if i'd be good at like live radio but yeah i don't know i like talking about science with you if that's oh. kind of corny oh it is corny Okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> Science is fascinating. But don't just take my word for it. Join us as we hear stories from scientists for everyone. I'm Shane Hanlon. And I'm Vicki Thompson. And this is Third Pod from the Sun. All right. Well, I asked you about being on TV because our interviewee today isn't on TV. At least that's not that's not his full time job. Mm -hmm. uh, but folks often think he should be based on his profession. Well, oh, so does does he sometimes have a daytime talk show? <laughs> then that would be that would be cool. I would love a. I was okay, going to say like a science based week. daytime talk show host, but I'm sure that thing exists in the world. Right. Um, but so, so we are still in the sciences, um, mm -hmm. not talk show host. And regardless of kind of what folks might think on based on our meandering introductions. Uh, so let's just, let's just hear from him and get into the sciencey part of this. Our interviewer was Ashley Hamer. I'm Dr. Marshall Shepard. I am the Georgia Athletic Association Distinguished Professor at the University of Georgia and the Director of the Atmospheric Sciences Program at the University of Georgia. Been there for about 15 years. I also host a podcast myself for the Weather Channel called Weather Geeks, and I'm a senior contributor to Forbes magazine as well. Yeah, so I was always that kid in the yard catching insects and down by creeks and streams looking at minnows and crawfish and those types of things. So I was just always curious about what was going on around me. I was an only child, so I spent a lot of time, frankly, by myself out in the yard and just doing things to kind of entertain myself. So that's always been my story as a science-interested kid. I was particularly interested in being an entomologist until I got stung and popped by a honeybee one day catching them in my yard and found out I was highly allergic to them. And so over time, I switched to my, my interest to a focus on weather and did a sixth grade science project on weather. And that's kind of how I got bitten, pun intended, by the weather bug. Amazing. Wait, how, but how did that happen? I mean, going from bugs to weather, what? Yeah, because well, the sixth grade science project fair was coming up. And I, I said, oh, well, I can't do my science project on bees anymore because they could kill me. And so I said, let's switch to weather. And so I made weather instruments from things we had around the house, started taking weather uh, observations and developed a little weather model for my community. And so it won the science fair. We've talked about this before, uh, but remind me, because if I forget... Everyone else probably forgets. What's a favorite science fair 
or memorable science fair experiment that stood out to you in your youth? Oh, yeah. So I think when we talked about it before, I talked about my balsa wood tower that needed oh, to like yes. suspend weight. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, I think that's the only one I could remember. So if there was anything else. <laughs> I don't what's, remember. What's so, what's so interesting about this, because I do remember the discussion, we talked about like I would make bridges and things to yeah. hold up. But I honestly, I remember two science fair experiments and one huh. was about sound and one was about magnets. But I'm sure that, that neither of them were interesting. Oh, um, okay. But I'm sure I'm we did many, many more. And considering like me especially, I went on to be a quote unquote yeah. scientist. Um Maybe that says something about why I'm podcasting in my basement now instead of <laughs> <laughs> instead of actually researching. Oh boy. Um, but to get back to the interview, so here's actually the part of that interview that our again meandering prompt actually set up. When I tell people I'm a meteorologist, people immediately ask what channel I'm on or ask me what the forecast is tomorrow. I'm like, you know, only six to eight percent of meteorologists are TV meteorologists. There's a whole nother world of meteorologists at the National Weather Service and in private companies like Delta Airlines or energy companies or researchers in EPA, NASA and so forth. And so that was the side of the house I was always most interested in. So I did not have any mentors that were telling me that. But I, I read a lot about Dr. George Washington Tarver who was a peanut scientist at Tuskegee Institute. And so he kind of inspired me on the research side. And so I just started doing my research and homework and said, okay, where's a good place I could go to college to study meteorology at that level? And so it turns out that Florida State University was one of the top programs and it happened to be in the South. I'm from the Atlanta area, so. Nice. So you said George Washington Carver was was kind of an inspiration. Were there Were there people that you wished you had seen for inspiration? No, because, you know, as a, you know, as a young black scientist, you just didn't see that. <laughs> and so, you know, you know, that's one of the challenges that I try to sort of overcome for others today. I mean, you just, you know, in the demographic that I come from, the socioeconomic culture that I come from, people weren't scientists. You didn't see scientists, like, and particularly ones that look like me. So you had to kind of, I had to find a mentor through books in the library, uh, reading about Dr. George Washington Carver. Now, I knew about him because my mother went to Tuskegee Institute herself. She was an alum, and so that's how I had been introduced to who he was. And then I just read a ton of books about him to sort of for my inspiration. Even today, you know, in terms of you know, very sort of underrepresented numbers in science, particularly my science, and to this day, and it was even worse back then. So you just kind of had to make your own way, and it's still kind of that way. And so I just started doing the things I needed to do to make sure I could get into Florida State and to prosper in a meteorology program because quiet is kept. Meteorology is a lot of physics, fluid dynamics, calculus, and so forth, thermodynamics. And so you have to be really good at those topics. You have to take Calc 1, Calc 2, and Calc 3. You have to take a lot of physics, uh, thermodynamics. And so you got to prepare yourself. So I started making sure I was going to be able to withstand the rigor of an atmospheric sciences degree. Because I even today, I have kids that walk into my office saying, oh, I love clouds, or I want a storm chase, or I like hurricanes. And I was like, that's good, but that's not what meteorology really is in atmospheric sciences. But it is true that people just think we look at clouds or hold our finger up or something. I mean, the atmosphere is a fluid on a rotating body, so it's governed by the same fluid dynamics equations that govern any fluid flow. And so, uh, you know, it's a lot of thermodynamics and fluid dynamics and atmospheric physics and uh, quantum physics and you know, the, the the models that we use for weather prediction are solving the Navy or Stokes equation. So there are integration problems involving calculus. So it's actually one of the more quantitative sciences on a college campus. But, I, I you know, people come in with their own biases of what they think it is. So, Right. I mean, what what kinds of things are you discovering in your research? I've been acknowledged with things like the, the Presidential Early Career Award at the White House and for the, the AMS Landsberg Award for the work I've done on how urban environments, how cities impact weather, particularly thunderstorms and rainfall. So that's kind of what I'm known for in terms of my research. But I've also published something on, on hurricanes, something called the Brown Ocean Effect, which is this idea that hurricanes can re-intensify or maintain their intensity when they move over land if the, the soil is wet or if there's over a wetland or sort of a swampy region. Uh, that's called the Brown Ocean Effect. So my research group is fairly well known for that. We've done research on climate vulnerability and risk, looking at who's most vulnerable to climate extremes like heat waves, floods, drought, and so forth. 
We have some new research going on right now looking at who's most vulnerable to or living in urban heat islands and, and, and why that has happened over the last few decades as well. Our research is not intended to improve weather prediction all the time. Sometimes it's just about improving understanding or uh, building better models. But yeah, I, I guess you could say that. For So for example, you know, the work we've done on how cities can create their own thunderstorms, now that catches people off guard. But sometimes in the summertime, cities like Atlanta or Houston literally are creating their own thunderstorms. And so we know that from a research standpoint. So how do we better predict that? I just published a paper in the peer-reviewed literature on some clues and signs about the atmosphere that can help determine that. But a lot of times research is also just trying to improve models. I spent a good portion of my career at NASA working on large satellite missions that would help us better understand the weather climate and hydrological or wet water cycle system just from a purely understanding standpoint. How does a, a soil moisture in the land communicate with the atmosphere? So, you know, you know, that's kind of the side of the house I've always been on in the meteorological community, research and development from the standpoint of understanding Vicky, did you know that cities could create their own thunderstorms? I did not know that, but I feel like it's one of those things that you just never, ever think about, but it makes great sense. You, yeah. you know, you can imagine no, I mean, the science behind it. Yeah, ditto. I, I don't, I, I, does that make us, are we not curious people? Is that a bad thing? Or we should we be more curious Oh, there's so many things? things to be curious about. We can't True. blame ourselves for not being curious about every single thing. Fair enough. Yeah. And, and and frankly, I didn't I didn't know about this either. Uh, no. But to your point, yeah, when you start thinking about it and it, it does kind of make sense. Um, and and Marshall, wa, he talked a lot about the research he's done, including some of the stuff he just mentioned. But frankly, things for him weren't always that easy. You know, I remember one of the things that was really interesting to me is I met my wife in grad school and to get a PhD, you have to take something called your comprehensive exams. And so I remember one time being concerned that I was going to fail those because I was trying to date her. And so spending a lot of time going out on dates and things like that. But no, luckily I did pass those. You know, I've been pretty blessed in the sense that I don't know that I've had major setbacks. I, you have setbacks in your career. For example, as a, sci as a publishing scientist and professor, you submit research to peer-reviewed journals and oftentimes they get rejected. And so every scientist at some point in their career has to get over this idea that, oh, wow, that research that I just submitted, I thought it was, you know, really sound and methodologically appropriate and so forth. But then you've got this anonymous group of experts that are saying, no, you did something wrong there. You didn't think about this. And so I think that's one of the biggest challenges for many early career scientists, including myself when I was younger. Another challenge I've, I've just faced is, we, I alluded to it earlier, just being a, an African-American in this field, they're just I've had some challenges with people making assumptions about, you know, why I was in certain places or, you know, uh, did I deserve to be there? Or I had a group of people walk up to me. I was president of the AMS at the time, and uh, I was standing there with a group of people in suits, and they assumed I was the airport shuttle driver for whatever reason, not the other three people standing with me. So those were challenges that I've faced over the years as well. But Yeah. Yeah, I've definitely heard stories from – Black academics who are like turned away at their own institutions when they go in on a weekend or something. It's just yeah, it's no, it's, it's, it's yeah. We deal with those kinds of things. I've written in Forbes about an experience, a uh, couple of experiences that I had like that. I was driving in a rental car when I was at NASA one time and was pulled over and told I matched the description of car thieves in the area. So you know, those are just realities, and I don't say those for you to know, like for, for people listening to just to say, oh, poor thing. No, that's that's not what I'm saying. I just want want people to understand that you know I'm considered one of the top climate scientists in the world and yet you know I still deal with things like that so it's just important to understand so that we can all move forward that's why I wrote a book in 2020 called the race awakening of 2020 a six-step guide for moving forward and I tried to just answer questions for people in terms of how we all can no matter who we are and what our backgrounds are how we can be better stewards and you know citizens of each other I'm a big fan of 80s music I mean you're way too young to maybe even know who this group is but there's a group called Depeche Mode, and they had a song called People Are People back in the mid-80s. And if you just listen to the lyrics of that song, it really is how we should all live. 
Oh, that's great. I, I, I'm going to have to refresh my memory on that one. I, I, I know Depeche Mode, but that song... It's totally a song that is relevant, at least the lyrics are, to the times that we live in, particularly in a post-George Floyd era, which was my inspiration for writing that book. That's great. Well, what about personal achievements that you're most proud of? Do you have any of those? My family. The, my personal achievements I'm most proud of are the fact that I have a, a beautiful wife and two healthy kids that are doing doing well. But I would say professionally, you know, last year in 2021, I got a triple whammy. I was totally surprised by it. And then I was elected to the National Academy of Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences all in the same year. Now, most scientists, their entire career won't be elected to any of those. And I was elected to all three. So that was stunning. And so that that clearly is one of the pinnacle achievements of my career, because, you know, I wrote a Forbes article trying to explain to people perhaps that aren't in our field or in science is what that means. I was like, that's basically like getting the the Academy Award or a Grammy Award in music for sciences or engineering. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the uh, the EGOT of, of yeah. science or something. Yes. Yeah. That's amazing. My question to you, Vicky, is do you think you could ever win an EGOT? Like the traditional one, Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, Tony. Do you have those skills? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like, well, if they lowered the standards hugely, yeah, then maybe I feel like. So what Emmy, Emmy show, Grammys, music, Oscars, uh movie, Tony is performance, like theater performance. Yeah, yeah. So I used to do, I used to do a little stage acting. Ooh. um, You know, High School Musicals, Mm -hmm. except for not the musical, like the afternoon matinee only, (laughs) not the headliner, and then. and I feel were like I'm a like, natural entertainer. You were, you were in the ensemble of the matinee. <laughs> yeah. Just the furthest from the furthest to the back. <laughs> yeah. I, again, I've, I've done all of the things that one could require or, yeah. or all of these things. But yeah, for me, the answer is hard no. Uh, no. <laughs> hard no. <laughs> you, you know, one of the things that I'm really starting to get more into is we're, we're looking more at how urban heat islands, this, this fact that cities can tend to be warmer than surrounding rural areas, how, you know, we're starting to do some things that are more sort of sort of in the field, if you will, in terms of how how these things are disproportionately affecting certain people that are living in them. We've already identified that there are certain marginalized groups that are disproportionately exposed to heat in cities. But something that I think that's going to be really exciting for me is we're starting to now explore something called thermal hydrological heat islands. Uh, We know that cities are warmer because of all the pavement and parking lots and things, but when it rains, that rain runs off on those hot surfaces and pavement into streams. And so you have this situation where this warm water, because of the city, is running off into streams, lakes, and the ecosystem and is affecting the ecosystem because that water is warmer. So uh, with this new line of research on these hydrological heat islands, that may actually get me closer to getting to streams and creeks, which is one of the things that I used to do quite a bit of as a kid, just go and hang out and play around those little streams and creeks. I also really want to kind of get to the Amazon uh, one day because it's just a fascinating region to me, period. But it also has a very important impact on our global weather and climate system as well. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Yeah. Same. The Amazon sounds incredible. Yeah, it's really fascinating. We call it the, you know, the green ocean because it sort of provides so much water to the atmosphere that affects the global global weather climate patterns around the world. What do you see is one of the biggest challenges in science? So one of the biggest challenges I see today in science is the Wikipedia University, Blog State University, and Twitter tw- tech. This idea that people actually think they know as much about or understand as much about science as the experts. I get people all the time that's, you know, give me these sort of cliche, what I call zombie theories about climate change. I call them zombie theories because they just live on on Twitter and blogs, although we've just, the science has dismissed those things long ago. So uh, there are tons and tons of these zombie theories. Oh, it hasn't 
warm since 1998 or you said it was going to cool and go, we were going to go into an ice age in the 1970s or science is just they're saying that ho- it's a hoax. They're just saying this for grant money uh, or you're, 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 it's the solar cosmic rays from the sun or solar radiation from the sun that's causing all of these things have been long refuted in the science. There are clear explanations for all of these zombie theories. I even have a TED talk out there uh, called Slaying the Climate Zombies, where I kind of deal with some of these. And then my more recent TED talk is on three things that shape people's bio- perceptions of science. So I invite the listeners to look up either of those TED Talks. There are also some really good websites out there, like skepticalscience.com or, or real, I think it's called realclimate.org, that actually are sites that will answer and sort of refute many of these zombie theories that are out there. I've heard them all in the Waffle House. I've heard them all at the highest levels from the Waffle House to the White House. I testified before Congress. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I've been at, at meetings at the White House. So it, it, there's really nothing that anyone can sort of say about sort of climate denialism or skepticism that I have not heard at this point. And, and the new thing that we're dealing with, just to kind of circle back to your question about challenges, is we're dealing with what we call climate delayism. This idea that you've seen the sort of narrative evolved to climate change is not real to, okay, maybe it's real, but it's not that bad to now climate delayism, which is where certain groups are attacking the solutions and sort of trying to delay action on the solutions that we know need to take place to, to sort of beat back the climate crisis. Mm. Yeah. That's not one that I've heard. Yeah. But I mean, yeah, climate delayism. I was just invited to the white house about three or four weeks ago for a special conference among 18 or so scientists to talk about how we can overcome climate delayism. I think the earth is showing us that climate is changing in our weather and sea level and ice, Arctic ice and, you know, agricultural productivity, all the things that affect our, what I call kitchen table issues in our homes. You know, I like polar bears. They're cute, but this is not about polar bears for me. This is about food productivity and water supply and national security and our economy, things that are happening right now, not, a, not happening to polar bears, not happening in the year 2080. So those are messages that I've tried to convey when we talk about climate change. And so we know that these things are happening. And I firmly believe we need an Apollo or Manhattan Project level effort on climate in the same way we tackle those problems, because it's here and now it's impacting us and it's likely only going to amplify So do you have any advice for a person who might want to follow in your footsteps? Be sure to be skillful at writing, speaking, persuasive arguments. These skills that you may not necessarily attribute with being a scientist, because we have to move the science out of the ivory tower into the policy space, into sort of practitioner space and so forth. So that's some of the biggest advice I would give today. Uh, be, and also be versatile. Don't don't sort of be very narrow. I think we are in an era of interdisciplinary science, though I study weather and climate. I work with geographers and epidemiologists and uh, hydrologists, social scientists that are trying to understand how people perceive risk and com- weather communication. So increasingly, uh, we are in a world of interdisciplinarity. And so I, I don't think the next generation of scientists should be as siloed or narrowly focused as perhaps what we're going to need going forward. All right, Vicki, bringing everything back around to the beginning, have you thought about what your daytime talk show would be called? Um... Yes, I have. But I feel like I need a marketing team to like think it out with me. So I have the okay the first idea that we might put on the dry erase board and then we can like brainstorm it. You're really um, burning a lead here. What? You're burning oh, the lead. That's my that's my habit. So uh like something about synapse. Like I feel like the space in between thoughts <laughs> would be the theme of my talk would it, show. Would it be about science? Oh, no, that's why I feel like it needs a f- more. Maybe it could be. There could be a I science segment. You, I love that you would have a sciencey name that would have nothing yeah. to do with science. I feel like, yeah, <laughs> I feel like a marketing department would either love this or just be like, Vicky, what are you doing? Get what out is, of what here. What's going on here? <laughs> I'm taking your show away from you. <laughs> well, just something that w- would convey like the space between thoughts where, you know, that kind of. 
I mean, it's very Wait. clever. I, I do. I'm, I'm giving you crap for it, but no, that's that's quite lovely. Yeah. Maybe maybe we'll end up doing. Uh, maybe we'll have a special episode where you're in the lead, and we'll do. We'll uh, we can we can have uh, you have your title, and we can just oh treat it gosh. like a audio version of a talk show. I love the the fear in your eyes right now. <laughs> I feel like well, so I feel like my my thoughts are so disconnected sometimes that I would need to like draw a map that people could clutch while they listen. So that they wouldn't feel completely lost. It's why I, I it's why we edit this podcast, Vicky. <laughs> for for you and me both and for all of our listeners. <laughs> oh man. So with that, that is all from Third Pod from the Sun. Special thanks to Ashley Hamer for conducting the interviews and to NASA for sponsoring the series. This episode was produced by Zoe Swiss and me with audio engineering from Colin Warren. Artwork by Karen Romano Young. We'd love to hear your thoughts, so please rate and review us, and you can find new episodes in your favorite podcasting app or at thirdpodfromthesun.com. Thanks all, and we'll see you next week. All right. Well, hmm. I asked you about being on TV because our interviewee today isn't on TV, uh, or at least that's not uh, his full-time job, but folks often think he should be based on his profession. Oh, okay. So obviously in the science, sh- mm-hmm. might be on TV, sometimes on TV, maybe a meteorologist. All right, Vicky, you're not actually supposed to like guess it. We need to do this again. Oh, come on. No, no, because he like that's... Because well, I want to say... Oh, because that's, like, that's him. What do you want to say? I wanna, well, because I want to say, because I immediately th- am thinking about um, uh, Mr. Wizard. No, he's always on TV. Was always Bill Nye. Do you know Mr. Wizard? Uh, I don't know Mr. Wizard. Are you kidding? Who's I guess Mr. I am Wizard? older than you. It's okay. It's just another thing for you to Google. This episode's just going to be outtakes. We're oh just going to do. I can't <laughs> Who's believe. Mr. Wizard? He's like Bill Nye before Bill Nye. I mean, Bill Nye's pretty old. In age, and just to be but... clear, we we joke about age. You're like. Only what, like a couple years older than me? Like we're not generationally I'm like split. barely older than you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, like- <laughs> Mr. Wizard. Oh yeah. Oh okay. Yes. These are black and white pictures. He was. <laughs> <laughs> You're just older in spirit than <laughs> I am, Mr. Oh. Wizard. Oh yeah. It was like from 1951 to 1965. He was a TV. Bill Nye. Okay.